Hello and welcome to today's student lecture. My name is Alistair Hodge. I'm head of the School of Humanities and Journalism and I would like to welcome everyone here today. It's a real joy. I hope wherever you are, it's a beautiful spring day as it is here. One of the enormous benefits of um, remote learning is the ability to put on events like this and anybody can join us from wherever they happen to be. Just a couple of notes. We are uh, availing ourselves of the opportunity that uh, the technology um, accords us. We are recording the event so that people can catch up with it and watch it at a later date. And the second thing to note is that there is a Q&A open as part of the, the lecture series. And you should be able to find that on your screen. Do please take the opportunity to uh, to type in any questions and toward at the end of the, the lecture we'll have an opportunity to go through those questions and um, put those to John so that he can answer them. So once again welcome to today's lecture and it gives me enormous pleasure and um, indeed I find it an honour to be able to introduce Professor John Steele and to deliver this talk. John is relatively new here at the University of Derby, having joined us in September 2020. Before that, he was a senior lecturer in journalism and political communication at the University of Sheffield. And we welcome him here today as a research professor in journalism at the University of Derby. John's work is broad. It draws uh, from the areas of political theory, the history of ideas, education, political communication and journalism studies. He has over 30 publications, including journal articles, books and book chapters <coughs> with topics in these areas. And he currently works in the field of media ethics. His talk today, which I'm sure you're going to find incredibly engaging, topical and interesting. And just a reminder, do put uh, questions into the uh, Q&A during the talk and at the end we'll, we'll mop those up at the end and allow John the opportunity to uh, respond. John's talk today will seek to historically contextualise the ongoing controversies around freedom of speech with a particular emphasis on the so-called no-platforming debate in British universities. So without further ado, and I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming John, I hand over to, to John Steele. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Alistair. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be with you all today. And thank you for inviting me to, to, to give the lecture. Um, as Alistair says, this is a, a particularly hot topic. Um, and really that the lectures is looking to try and historically contextualize the current debate about free speech as Alistair says particularly on on university campuses um, could I have the, the next slide please so I'm sure you're all aware that it was only last month that the education secretary Gavin Williamson announced what he called landmark proposals to strengthen free speech at universities these proposals included the creation of a free speech and academic freedom champion who will sit on the board of the Office for Students and investigate potential infringements in universities. So things like no platforming and the dismissal of academics and students for expressing controversial views and so on. He also announced the, uh, the a free speech condition, which will have the potential to impose sanctions, including financial penalties, on any UK universities not upholding the right to freedom of speech on campus. As such, we're seeing an extension of legal powers to uphold free speech in universities. And I think this will cover student unions as well in, in, in more sort of rigorous uh, terms. The reason for this intervention is the, the apparent widespread concern that freedom of speech, particularly on campuses, universities, as has been and, and is uh, under sustained attack. 
Concern seems to be reflected in public opinion research on the topic. For example, a recent study conducted by YouGov commissioned by Prospect magazine suggested that 48% of British voters thought that there are many important issues these days where people are just not allowed to say what they think. 67%, a two to one majority of the people polled, rejected the idea that more care is needed to when it comes to language, when it comes to speaking to people. The view expressed was that far too many people are really too concerned and have easily offended these days compared to the past. Other research conducted by Jonathan Grant for the Policy Institute at King's College London suggests that university students are broadly in agreement with the general population about the general value of freedom of expression for our society. It's seen as a good thing. However, rather than being worried about freedom of expression being under threat on campus, the students surveyed were more concerned about freedom of expression in wider society, as most students were broadly supportive of how their universities supported freedom of expression. Interestingly, the King's study also indicates that 81% of students think that freedom of expression is more important now than ever. But actually 86% are specifically concerned that social media is enabling people to express intolerant views. And this apparently uh, is reflected, is mirrored, if you like, in trends in the uh, general population. However, to put this crisis in perspective, rec recent figures from the Office of National Statistics stated in 2018 that there were over 62,000 requests for external speakers at English universities, and only 53 of these were turned down. Despite these figures, there are, there are other studies out there um, that seem to be responding to the contemporary concern about freedom of expression and its apparent erosion. So what I'd like to do today in, in the lecture is really try and provide some historical context to this current sense of urgency and anxiety about freedom of speech on campus, but also in wider society. In doing so, I hope to emphasise the broader historical and political dynamics that suggest that I suggest are currently uh, shaping this debate today. Before I start, though, I'd like to make a brief point about the emphasis, the single quote marks around the word panic in the title of my lecture. I'll say from the outset that I do think that free speech is under pressure from all manner of uh, forces. Clearly, there are significant threat threats to freedom of speech from autocratic and re repressive regimes across the world, and these should be challenged and call out called out. Threats to press freedom in particular continue to undermine broader freedoms and democratic rights all over the world, including in the UK. So freedom of speech and freedom of the press is under, is under pressure, I think. My position is that we should always try and ensure that robust debate on campus is protected. And the evidence suggests, for the most part, this is, it is protected. But the emphasis around the word panic is there to signal my unease about the particular way in which this debate is currently manifest. And this is something that I hope to make clear in the lecture. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what is the, what's the concern? What's the issue? So I think in broad terms, uh, and taking this outside of the university context for a moment, as the figures mentioned uh, suggest, there seems to be concern that people feel less able to freely say what they think than previously, that freedom as, of speech, as the Americans call it, is being chilled. They, they use the term the chilling of free speech. It's been eroded. In recent years, there seems to have been an increasing emphasis on this erosion of freedom of speech, not just on university campuses, but across the public sphere, in the media and public debate, both in the United Kingdom, but also elsewhere in the US, for example. The view seems to be that woke culture and snowflake sensibilities are actually stifling opportunities for rigorous discussion and debate. The fear of causing offence is apparently degrading our deliberative capacities as human beings. Many commentators have looked on these cases of evidence of how identity-based politics, the realms of political life which are tied to notions of personal or group identity, are undermining of freedom of speech by eroding our capacity to ask difficult and challenging questions of ourselves as a society. The examples cited are usually quite high profile, 
from Jermaine Greer allegedly being no platform by Cardiff University for her apparent transphobic views, to Boris Johnson during his time at, as London Mayor being no platform by King's College London, for his comments on Barack Obama's um, allegedly part Kenyan heritage. In both cases, neither were denied a platform at the events to which they were invited, though Johnson uh, actually declined the uh, original invitation. Can I have the next slide, please? Of course, there are genuine examples of individuals and groups being denied a platform to speak at universities and on campus. But as Evan Smith has highlighted in his book, No Platform, many of those who have been denied a platform at universities since the early 1970s have tended to be on the extreme right, the, the Nazis or the fascist sympathizers who've used the free speech argument to peddle their racist views. Student groups have historically sought to deny racists a platform as a political response to the growth of racism and fascism in society more generally. Yet some argue that we must still allow the views of those who we most vehemently disagree with. Otherwise, how can we hold them to account? How can we defeat racism if we don't confront it head on? What better way to do this is than through open debate? This was an argument that was successful when uh, the BBC invited the British National Party leader Gr Nick Griffin onto its flagship programme Question Time in 2010. The perspective was let, let his views be heard, let the people make their own minds up. Of course, this seems to be a perfectly reasonable position to hold. One of the key arguments underpinning the view that free speech is under threat is that we live in an increasingly therapeutic culture and that adults and university students are adults, of course, are constantly being infantilized as sensitivities are prioritized over rational argument and rigorous debate. Those who hold this view, and I'll call them the free speech absolutists, the term borrowed from John Durham Peters, tend to suggest that as a society, we just need to grow up and stop infantilizing our culture, as this only serves to limit freedom of speech, but also wider human agency. These ideas are partly grounded in classical political liberal theory, as I'll come on to show. However, on another level, these ideas and arguments strike a somewhat reactionary tone as they fail to grasp or acknowledge the dynamic nature of culture and that modes of representation and identity, which whether they like it or not, are increasingly seen as expressions of personal and group empowerment and political engagement. And I'd like to speak to these two elements in more detail over the course of the, the rest of the lecture, if I may. Can I have the next slide, please? So from John Milton's Areopagitica, 1644, to John, Mil John Stuart Mill's classic On Liberty of 1855. The idea that any impediment to discussion is inherently self-limiting for society and individuals is particularly persuasive. The development of new knowledge and ideas demand rigorous challenge and debate. Otherwise, how do we move forward as, as a society? The enlightenment and the birth of modern modernity has only been made possible by the free exchange of ideas. John Stuart Mill also had much to say about how individual freedoms can be stifled by conformity and the adherence to social orthodoxies. Of course, similar sentiments are evident in some of George Orwell's work, as Orwell was keen to emphasise the overbearing capacity of the state on diminishing the human spirit. Orwell, of course, was talking about authoritarian societies, but also authoritarian tendencies within democratic societies. Mill, though, was aware of the threat of social conformity, not only in its capacity to stifle the development of knowledge and understanding, but also its capacity to limit human agency. And a version of this idea was followed up by political scientist Elizabeth Noel Newman in her theory of the spiral of silence in the 1970s. Newman argued that public opinion can have a stifling effect on one's ability to express one's views, especially if these views are viewed by the speaker to run counter to the prevailing views of society. Hence the tendency for one to spiral it into silence, the fear of social ridicule. Some of Newman's thinking seems to me at least to be evident in the notion that one can no longer say this or that for fear of offence, a reaction, if you will, to the spiral of silence that Newman was talking about. Can I have the next slide up, please? But of course, there are limits. What about these limits? Where should the line be drawn? 
When does freedom of speech or expression actually cross the line? Well, to be sure, most free speech advocates and most free speech absolutists, although not all, agree that there should be some limits to expression when there is an imminent risk of harm. Things like child abuse imagery or national defence information, private information and so on should not be protected under a free speech principle. Of course, as I say, there are exceptions. Most signal some limit. So what are these limits and how do we make sense of them? Again, returning to classical political theory, John Stuart Mill came up with the idea of the harm principle and gave the example of the corn dealer in his book on liberty, really to demonstrate the acceptable limits to free expression. He suggested that it's OK to express and circulate, for example, the view that, that 19th century corn dealers are starvers of the poor if this view is expressed and circulated in the press. Corn dealers at that time, of course, were the contemporary bogeymen, often blamed for, for prioritising profit over the needs of the poor. But if such an opinion was expressed to an excited mob outside the house of a corn dealer, then it was legitimate to, to, concert that, to, to curb that expression, as the liberty of the corn dealer was itself under threat. You may have well come across the well-rehearsed dictum that it's not OK to shout fire in a crowded theatre where there's no fire, as this will likely cause imminent harm to those inside caught up in the panic to escape. And this is a similar sort of, of argument. So for Mill and, and for other free speech absolutists, it's only when imminent harm is likely to be the result of a particular speech act should it be curtailed. Just to note that it's not just liberals and those on the right who take this view. Noam Chomsky, the well-known US academic and someone who describes himself as being on the anarchist left, also thinks that freedom of speech should be curbed only when imminent harm is a likely result. So what about the right of fascists to have a platform? Many argued the fact that uh, Nick Griffin made such a fool of himself on national television proves the point that bad ideas can be brought down by rigorous debate. Griffin was soon ejected as leader, leader of the BNP and the party itself seemed to disappear from public view. However, by allowing someone like Griffin a platform, some commentators are, have argued that his appearance essentially credentialised his worldview and made it acceptable for such opinions to be aired. Therefore, allowing someone like Griffin or Tommy Robinson uh, a platform, particularly on mainstream media, effectively gives their views a semblance of credibility. One of the key arguments for no platforming of fascists is that their democratic right, they assert to, to free speech, would actually be denied others if they were to achieve power. In other words, it makes no sense for a democracy to, miss, to permit speech, which could itself be used to undermine the foundations of democracy. And these are ongoing debates and, and, and still, I think, pertinent to the discussion, as I'm sure you're aware, and as, as we'll come on to talk about a little later. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So let's let's try and put some of the current crisis in context. Um, we've established some of the intellectual parameters, but by no means all of the intellectual parameters within this debate. So I want to turn now and look at some of the historical aspects of the current period. For that, we have to turn to the 1980s and the political and cultural shifts that occurred under Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the UK. Can I have the next slide, please? Jennifer scatton Burler has written about how the emergence of Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and the new right in the United States was in part a reaction to the countercultural movements of the 1960s and the political and cultural gains that had been made by civil rights activists, feminism, gay rights, and the advent of a broader base of identity politics. She notes that the new right saw these developments as contributing to the breakdown of US society via the erosion of traditional American values and took step, steps to target sites where these ideas seem to be most prominent. The main targets were the media and the university campuses. The media as an institution was seen as a prominent, was prominent in contributing to the erosion of these traditional values, but also importantly universities, which has seen a growth in new programs that interrogated notions of gender and race, race politics, 
these became targets for sustained attacks from the new right at this time. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So in Britain, we saw similar political developments. Margaret Thatcher, of course, was highly influenced by new, new right libertarian thinking and made significant strides in reshaping British society, both politically and economically, but also culturally. In the realm of culture, like in the US, this came to the fore, of course, in debates about political correctness or PC as, it, as it's known. And what you think about political correctness depends generally on where you sit on the political spectrum. It's, it's a reasonably good barometer, I think. Those on the right of the political spectrum tend to consider some examples of PC, of course, as a form of censorship, where those with controversial views are cancelled, although this wasn't a term that was used in that context at the time. Political correctness gone mad is the usual refrain that I'm sure you've heard. From the left, political correctness tends to be about challenging language and social practices, which are perceived to be discriminatory, sexist, misogynistic, homophobic, or racist. Next slide, please. Often this public debate about PC was carried out in the pages of the national press. However, it also made its way into the real world of politics and it impacted on people's lives directly. Most notably, the 1988 Local Government Act, Clause 28, or Section 28, as it was known. This, this policy sought to prevent discussion, or as the government saw it, the promotion of homosexuality in schools and other, other publicly funded services like citizens advice and youth centres or in libraries. As the slide indicates, the policy sought to prevent local council funding, which was considered as intentionally promoting homosexuality or publishing material with the intention of promoting homosexuality, or promote the teaching of, in any maintained school, of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended fam family relationship. I mean, looking back at this now, the language is, is quite shocking. In, in 2010, the then Conservative PM, David Cameron, publicly apologised for this policy and said he deeply regretted its implementation, though he voted against its repeal in 23 when in opposition. That said, his coalition government, of course, recognised the damage done by the policy and went on to legalise gay marriage in 2013. But I want to emphasise here is that, that though this is clearly an assault, this was clearly an assault on gay identity, Section 28 was also a political device to disempower local government, and particularly those troublesome left-wing local authorities that the Conservative administrations under Mrs Thatcher were so ideologically opposed to. Reducing funding and, and changing the rules on how authorities could spend taxpayers' money undermined their ability to target areas of significant need, social services, youth and community services, and so on. This effectively neutered their political power as central government reined in financial control over local government over that decade. Can I have the next slide, please? So what does all this have to do with the no platform debate today? Well, I think that there are, are really important parallels between the 80s and today in that the debate is about language and its scope really mirrors uh, the way in which it occurred during the 1980s. In fact, it's many of the same ideological sentiments that we see today from the libertarian right, which echo those of the conservative governments of the 1980s. The current cabinet, of course, is made up of many diehard supporters of Mrs Thatcher, Dominic Raab, Priti Patel, Jacob Rees-Mogg, amongst others. And I'd argue that the government's initiative to protect free speech on campus is actually as politically motivated as those of Mrs Thatcher's attack on local government in the 1980s. Not only is this, an intended, is this intended to further marginalise progressive voices and ideas, but it's effectively a power grab an attempt to rein in institutions that don't conform to or who have the audacity to challenge the existing ideological orthodoxy. We see the political cheerleading seen during the 1980s today from the right wing press, the Telegraph, the Mail and across the Murdoch titles, as Julian Petley, Ivor Gaber and James Curran have pointed out in their book Media Wars. The threat to defund universities that are just not to be upholding adequate free speech protections are similar those to those calls to defund the BBC 
which according to this perspective is a hotbed of snowflake, snowflake culture. And I think this stems just like during the 1980s from a political move against what is considered some pro progressive political discourse. Now the next slide, please. This is also amplified uh, today by high profile celebrities and public figures like Piers Morgan, Lawrence Fox and Toby Young, who, despite their cries of censorship, continue to be able to make their opinions known to all. For example, Toby Young's Free Speech Union, which claims that it's a non-partisan mass membership public interest body and that stands up for the rights of its members and suggests that free speech is in greater peril now than, than at any time since um, the Second World War. Likewise, we've had spiked online widely reported free speech university rankings. Though now defunct, this purportedly ranked universities according to how well they sustain freedom of expression on campus. But I'd suggest that both of these exa examples are part of an attempt to draw attention to and amplify a crisis which is actually constructed out of their own libertarian or contrarian ideologies and political agendas. They are, in my view, manifestations of an attempt to reclaim political and cultural power via a confected culture war. So what you may say, everybody is entitled to a political opinion and viewpoint. Why would anybody be afraid of a battle of ideas? Why be afraid of free speech? And of course, I absolutely agree. The problem is, of course, as former president of the NUS, Malia Bouattia, suggested back in 2017, it should be obvious that young black working class, a young black working class student from inner city London does not have a voice as loud as, say, Tom Slater, the deputy editor of Spite. Safe spaces are not used on all campuses, but where they are, it is to amplify the voices of those who are struggling to be heard. It's about empowering them with their own freedom of expression. I agree. These claims that free speech is being eroded are actually reactionary moments which are intended to delegitimize real concerns about systemic prejudice and discrimination and carve out spaces in which it becomes acceptable to attack people on the basis of their identity politics. Let me explain. One of the key objections to the Black Lives Matter protests has been to assert that we no longer live in a racist society, that structural and systemic racism is more or less a thing of the past, we no longer live in a society where racial epithets and slurs are tolerated, and, and rightly so. People of colour are more visible in our culture and many, many hold positions of power more so than ever before. The current cabinet is, of course, very ethnically diverse, more so than, than any that I can remember. And these are undoubtedly good things. Next slide, please. However, as the Black Lives Matter campaign has made clear, Racism is, not, racism is not just about calling out blatant extremist language or views. It's also about the nuanced ways in which structural racism impacts the lives of people of colour and limit their life chances and health. As The Voice recently emphasised when discussing the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenoch's attack on the BLM, BLM movement, it's a fact that black, black people are four times more likely to die from COVID. It's a fact that black Caribbean students are twice as likely to be excluded than white students. It's a fact that black people are 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched by police. It's a fact that black people in employment are paid less on average than white people. Despite these facts, we're told by many free speech absolutists that we live, as I say, in a post-racist society and that the days of racism and discrimination are more or less behind us that even white people actually can be victims of racism. For example, when Lawrence Fox, the actor uh, on Question Time last year is, is challenged about his own status as a privileged white man, he can confidently turn on the audience member asking the question and accuse her of anti-white racism. So Jacks not only assert his own victimhood, in other words, you're attacking me on the basis of my race and denying me the opportunity to say so, etc. But it's also delegitimizing the experience of, of people who suffer from real discrimination day to day by effectively saying what you're telling me about your experience of racism is not really racism. Another example of this only last week can be seen in the fallout from the Meghan and Harry interview on, on Oprah. When Meghan is talking about her own experiences and perception of racism in the British media, 
Piers Morgan feels empowered to trash this on live television, later defending his views and asserting his right to free speech. The Society of Editors also very publicly denied that the British press is racist. I don't want to get into a discussion here about the role of British media or, or the monarchy. That might be a lecture for another day. But I do want to highlight that it's, it's these examples that just emphasise how free speech is being used as a weapon to undermine the lived experiences of those who speak out against discrimination and prejudice. Free speech, ironically, is being used to close down debate. Rather than promoting freedom of expression, this reactionary call to arms tends to act, tends to, act to silence those who might hold contrary views by looking to delegitimise the basis upon which their, their original complaints are made. Calling the Question Time audience member a person of colour, by the way, an anti-white racist is really an attempt to diminish her experiences of racism as a person of colour. It also provides further victim status for Fox. If people seek, speak out and draw attention to these examples where they might feel discriminated against or threatened, the basis of their complaints are often held up as, as examples of wokeness or politically correct, political correctness gone mad, as I say. Yet again, as I've already suggested, such cries of censorship are extremely selective and tend to be geared towards the interest of those that have a significant voice. These are the people, I think, who shout the loudest about political correctness and so-called cancel culture. But it's the reactionary nature of these claims of, of cancel culture that I would argue are the, are the real danger to freedom of expression. Can I have the next slide, please? Mondon and Winter note in their book Reactionary Democracy that though the idea that hate speech is free speech and that even fascists should be allowed a platform is usually echoed as a libertarian stance, they argue in fact that it's a highly reactionary position to take. They say that in our current context it's almost always the far and extreme right ideas which are used to test the limits of free speech, while more progressive causes uh, suff suffering from lack of coverage or voice are constantly and conveniently ignored or even attacked, as I've suggested. So I don't, I don't think we're living through a crisis of free speech. Rather, what we're witnessing is an urgent attempt to delegitimise real concerns about power and representation. The threat of removing funding from universities if they don't uphold the principle of free speech is really about delegitimising genuine debate about structural relate, racism, the treatment of minorities, homophobia and trans rights. It's also about attacking institutions that seek to, to challenge aspects of these as, aspects of society. What about those without a voice? What about those who don't have the opportunity to speak out about their experiences and treatment? What happens to these voices when they do speak out? Well, these questions inevitably bring me to the question of free speech and the debate concerning trans rights and the various controversies surrounding trans rights and, and the no platforming issue at universities. I think this is a really complex and challenging set of debates, but I would be hard pressed to assert that those involved in these discussions on either side are steered by a sort of privileged elite. Next slide, please. Take this person, for example, Julie Bindle. Bindle has been a, a tireless campaigner for women's rights and campaigned against violence towards women for decades. But in 2015, she was no platform by Manchester University because of an article published in The Guardian that was widely condemned as transphobic. Though she later unreservedly apologised for the article, the fury around her piece and controversy about her views and those of some of her other radical feminist co colleagues has remained. While the nuances of this debate are far too complex for me to go into here, as, at least as I understand them, understand them. Like many free speech, they, free speech debates, they revolve around language and its power to legitimise or validate a person's identity. What I will say is Evan Smith has powerfully argued that debates such as these demonstrate the shifting focus of no platforming as a form of political activism, as they highlight the flux and mutability of student politics and the debates and controversies therein. This is real world politics playing out with that playing out within our student unions and on our campuses, with students deciding for themselves the parameters of the debate. Smith then is signalling the ways in which student activism and the no platforming aspect of that 
is a part of political activism and it reflects the shifting cultural and social realities of life. What's ironic about those free speech idealists that seem to be in such a panic is that they fail to acknowledge the dynamics of culture and the priorities and concern and that priorities and concerns change in response to political and societal forces. As I mentioned earlier in the lecture, the free speech reactionaries tend to have a very fixed view of culture. Yet one of the successes of the student activist movement over the last 40 years is it's been abil its ability to respond to this, this shift and to utilize things like no platforming, sometimes as Smith says, in controversial circumstances, to reflect the messy complexity of student political life. So student politics seems to be alive and well, and I'd suggest that the best people to decide who should speak at student union events are the student body themselves. And though this can be a messy and fraught process, it's only right in my view that students make those decisions. Of course, universities should be part of those conversations as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So how have we got into this position whereby the free speech debate has reached such a high level of invective? If this is just a residue of the culture wars from the 1980s, how and why is it being sustained in our culture today? I think part of the reason we're continually being told um, that we're engaged in a, a culture war and free speech is on the line is that the left has been so bad at standing up and confidently defending free speech in the past. The problem we find ourselves in now, of course, is in part much of the making of the less left as it has repeatedly failed to challenge opposing discourses which are gradually being co-opted from progressive politics by the right. As US academic Jody Dean has suggested, one of the key successes of the right, the neoliberal right in particular, is that it has successfully used the very language of liberation and freedom that the left has sought to use over the last 40 or so years against left-wing and progressive ideas in society. We see this as the right has taken ownership of discussions about inequality and poverty, about representation, about the environment, about homophobia and racism and so on. The free speech panic it's just one manifestation of this. Ronan Burtonshaw has re recently published a piece on Double Down News, emphasising this very point. He argues that the left has been far too slow to respond to this discursive power grab by the right, which has adopted progressive language and used it effectively to delegitimise uh, progressive ideas. He notes, though, sarcastically, that it's interesting to see the anxiety about the erosion of free speech doesn't include discussions of things like the UK libel laws, which prohibit people from speaking truth to power, almost as most people generally don't have the financial resources to do so. It doesn't address the fact that large corporations can monitor their employees' social media accounts in case they speak out of turn about their working conditions. In other words, the right is very selective in its choice of targets and that it carefully avoids topics which ultimately pose a challenge to the status quo. Similarly, the prevent strategy, which was brought in to tackle extremism in, in, in universities, has, according to recent research, has actively chilled free speech on campus. This research has been highlighted in other studies, which suggest that, that charity law is also, being placed, is also placing pressures on student unions to conform to opposing agendas, one pushing them to uphold free speech the other pushing them towards risk aversion. The authors of these studies, Scott Bowman and Perfect, go on to note that we don't accept, that they don't accept, the right-wing populist view that sensitivity leads to no platforming on campus because the evidence shows that's the opposite. They do, however, note that the populist discourse around free speech is pushing some students towards a more absolutist approach, which, as I've said, can inhibit free speech rather than encourage it. So I hope you've gathered by now that I'm not convinced that the free speech uh, panic is, is a genuine panic. I don't think that free speech is under, under threat, certainly not in the way that reactionary voices suggested or su suggested it is. Of course, as a white middle class male professor, I'm very conscious of the privileged platform and status that I have. But there are many constituencies in society whose freedom to express their opinions and experience are limited and stifled. If anyone's freedom of expression is being curtailed, it's those constituencies. And I think institutions like ours have an obligation to try and address this. Questions of free speech are really questions about power. Who has it and how do they use it? 
In this case, it's about the power of some reactionaries to reframe the parameters of the debate about free speech overwhelmingly on their terms in their interests. By delegitimizing their opponents and by ascribing to them a derogatory status as moaners and, and woke politically correct censors, they are themselves asserting their power to silence others. Thank you. Thing. That's, that's the end of the lecture. Just put the last slide up, please. There are some uh, references on that on that last slide that uh, people might want to follow. Thank you, John, ever so much for for that really insightful lecture on um, a, a range of topics. Uh, I found it in incredibly interesting. Um, I've just noticed, um, delighted to see uh, from uh, Professor Dennis Hayes um, as a, a question pop up in the QA. It's a relatively long question, so I hope people will indulge me to take a few minutes to read and digest that before I put it to John. Um, just a reminder to anyone still um, listening, it, it's absolutely welcomed and encouraged for you to pop a question into the Q&A. Before I turn to uh, the, the, the to digesting the question by um, Professor Hayes, I've got two or three, John, that uh, were notified in advance. I'm pleased to say they, they, they seem to come from a variety of different standpoints and I'll read them out in no particular order. So first of all, John, if I can put this one to you. If totally free debate might tend to provoke violence or incite hatred in some way, where is the boundary line between legality and absolute freedom of expression? Thank you. That's a good question. I don't I don't think there is a, a absolute freedom of expression. And I think um, there are clear boundaries, as, as, as I try to emphasize in the lecture. Um, if you if you are if you err towards a more sort of free speech, protecting free speech position, then those boundaries are when when there is imminent danger, physical harm is 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 going to uh, is likely to be a result of those those words or those expressions. And the law makes it quite clear that incites, inc you know, speech that incites violence is illegal. So I don't I don't actually think there is absolute free speech because we're all we're all conditioned. We all we're all sort of there are parameters of, of constraint that exist in just in even in terms of language that, that limit our, our capacity to, to for total free speech. But I do think that um, when it comes to the boundaries, there are there are already uh, protections in place that, that that sort of impact on on the, the propensity of speech that will incite or has the potential to incite violence. But thanks for that question. Hopefully, it's hopefully it was dealt with in the in the lecture. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> we have another one here around. Do we need and this this possibly aligns with the one that we've already had in the Q&A. Do we need absolute freedom of speech so that there is an absolute path to challenge power? Isn't such absolute freedom essential for a functioning democracy? Yep, thank you for that question. I, I mean, I, I I would be very much sympathetic to that that line of um, that line of analysis. We need free speech in able to um, to hold power to account, to challenge um, discrimination, to challenge uh, sort of anti democratic tendencies within society. The problem that I try to emphasise in the lecture is that that, that free speech is in a way sometimes co-opted in a way to to drown out other voices and to effectively diminish their capacity or other people's capacity who don't have that platform or who may use come from a different political perspective uh, to, to try and diminish their perspective to try and diminish their um, capacity to, to utilize free speech so it's it's those in society that are often the sorts of weakest in society whose whose free speech rights are most under threat and it's for for that reason why i'm i'm very much a free speech advocate 
Um, it's it's I just I just reject the idea that the panic and the the discourse around free speech that we're seeing today is as, as it's been presented, as I've suggested. So yeah, free speech is fundamentally important to hold power to account. It's fundamentally important for democracy. It's fundamentally important for the development of knowledge. It's just we've got to be we've got to be more nuanced, I think, in the way in which we understand how free speech plays out in in society and how social mores and and, and, and culture shifts. And we have to respond to that and think about that in our discussions about free speech. Okay, thanks, John. Um, if I can perhaps um, read out uh, the question that we have on the Q&A from Professor Hayes. Okay. As a free speech absolutist, I'm not sure, John, if you can actually see the question on your, your no, screen, which is fine. Okay, um, so I think that, that's why I've decided it might be best to read it out. As a free speech absolutist, free speech, no if, ifs, no buts. I would go further than Mill. Examples like his corn dealer embody a diminished sense of human beings, implying that human beings are no more than attack dogs. Free speech absolutists believe that human beings can hear speech and respond to it as adults and do not need to be protected. Therapeutic or victim culture embodies this diminished view of human beings. See my book, The Dangerous Rise of Therapeutic Education. Identity groups are not strong, as you suggest, but embody victimhood and a diminished view of themselves. Thus, the need for censorship of views that hurt. Uh, formal no platforming may be less prevalent. Tell that to the director of SOAS, but attempts to stop people speaking through platforms, open letters and often secret disciplinary action terrify academics and students. They keep silent and do not invite controversial speakers. See AFAF's The Band List below, and there is a link in the QA that anyone uh, on the lecture can follow. Ironic that the first speaker on free speech in this series denies that there is a problem and sees free speech as a right wing issue. A pity that we're not having a debate. Perhaps we can follow that up later and try and uh, um, organise a, a public debate on this. I suggest those um, here open their eyes. Start below. Again, that's with the link uh, to the banned list. Over to you, John. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Thank you very much for that, Dennis. Um, lots, lots, lots in that question. I'll try and uh, respond to. Uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right about Mill. Um, he, he's used very um, emotive language. He uses the words of the mob, doesn't he? He, he uses the idea and he presents the idea that there is an unthinking mob of people potentially just going to respond um, to to the to this incitement. But I think I think he's also uh, reflective of this idea that actually incitement is a thing. You know that that people can be incited. That 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 incitement to violence is is a real thing and there are examples of that um, in society um, every day, um, particularly in the current sort of um, political milieu, if you like. The, the, the challenge that, that it's, it's just an issue, a problem for the right is, I, I don't agree, as I said in my lecture, that the left doesn't have a problem with free speech. I think, I think the left could be much more confident and assertive and maybe maybe less victim centered to use your your language in actually expounding uh, the values of free speech in its politically uh, progressive discourse and in, in its activism so i i, I think that the the, the current controversy is a, is has been whipped up by the right but i think part of that has been allowed because of the way in which the left has been so poor on questions of free speech it's, it's been it's been poor on on reflecting those <coughs> nuances and being confident in, in dealing with that. As for um, as for SOAS, um, I don't know too much about this. The, the, it was last week, wasn't it? Um, I think the director of SOAS used the N word in a, in a public discussion and has been uh, challenged about the use of that N word. That's perfectly acceptable to be challenged about the use of the, the N word. I don't, I don't see that as uh, I don't see that as a sort of uh, a chilling of free speech. It's, it's an offensive term. Um, 
I, I, don't, I don't I don't really know how I can come back at that. I mean, it's just a, an abhorrent thing to say. I just I disagree with the um, the sentiment that that um, the the identity politics embody victimhood. I think that's a, a quite a, a condescending and quite patronising thing to say. Uh, when people are actually trying to stand up for rights and trying to make their voices heard in in this clamour for for sort of you know this sort of attention that, that the likes of Fox and and Toby Young and, and others make it's about asserting asserting people's power those people who have less power to do so than the likes of Fox and um and, and Toby Young as I was saying so I, I think I disagree with the orientation of the question, where it's coming from. Um, I would agree with some aspects of the, the, the point about Mill, but uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that free speech is, as I say, I'm repeating myself, is under the sorts of threat that, um, that the question is suggesting. Thank you, John. I'll turn now to a question that, that came in just a few months ago from uh, Claire. Uh, thank you for a fascinating lecture. And why, John, do you think the left have been less effective than the right at shaping political debate and raising issues that address power imbalances? I think that's a great question, and and I wish I had a, a good answer. I think one of the problems has been that that clearly freedom and the uh, the language of freedom. Is so is so well accommodated on in in liberal circles and in 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 the, in the liberal and right, you know, freedom is is a catch-all phrase. It's, it's something that we see historically. We see it historically in the left as well, but less so in recent years. Um, maybe questions about identity have sort of dominated that discourse around freedom to the to the um, to the detriment of those questions about freedom. Maybe there should have been much more or there should be much more um, discussion about identity politics alongside questions about freedom. And, and the sort of argument I'm trying to, to tentatively, tentatively put forward today that actually you can make a, a case for freedom of speech from from a left wing position or from the left position. Um, but I, I think I think there are historic um factors that have have made that the case that have made the left much more much less resilient in in uh, championing free speech than the right and that has, of course has, has been as you would expect as anyone would expect has been seized upon by the right so yeah it's a great question it's a great question thanks john we have a, a another one here which i think perhaps talks more to um journalism okay um and it asks what your views are on state managed and state controlled information and news and the subtext here i think the question the question is asking how you counter it uh, in for example the campuses on places such as hong kong china and turkey okay so that's a, that's asking me for a, a view on political systems that are, that are not really democratic um, <laughs> i would i would be um I would be absolutely against, you know, state repression of the press, or state-backed repression of of the press, or any um, any voice for that matter. So I think that that you know, state silencing of of media of journalism is is a really bad thing. I thought the question was going to be talking, asking me to deal with the the the, um, the role of the state in the UK press. Um, I think that, I think that the the way in which the press is being regulated. The mainstream press has been regulated by IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organization, is is um, pretty ineffective. It's it's not very good at, at doing what it says it says it's doing. Uh, I think there are steps that we could take as a society to to help make uh, press regulation, press self regulation of that, and more effective and more. Um, more representative again of, of the, the broader constituency in society. I think that one of the problems with the mainstream press is it has sort of quite a narrow view and, and, and emerges from quite a narrow set of positions and, um, and areas. So I think I think a greater diversity of voices, as I said in, earlier in my lecture, is, is a good thing. And 
press regulation in the UK is something that, that could take account of that, I think. Um, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I think I think it's right to, to to draw the distinction between democratic societies and, and those that aren't. So thank you very much for that. Finally, um, fundamentally, is there a desire from the right to win the debate via appeal to the lowest common denominator of human and political debate, essentially, and that these are minority views from the right? And a, a follow up question on that is that is this part of a rejection of pluralism as a concept? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, what, where, what the right's motivations are and what their what their their ultimate end game is, you, you'd, you'd have to ask them. But certainly this is an attempt to to challenge pluralists, I think, challenge aspects of pluralism in society. Definitely. Um, I, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a view the, the evidence is there. You, you can see the dominant voices that are, are making these claims across the media, across the sort of media ecology, if you like. And this is an attack on, on, on uh, like, as I said, in the eight, in the uh, period of the 1980s, this is an attack to try and reclaim, reclaim some of that cultural ground that was seen to be given way from the 1960s um, it, with, the, with the advent of political correctness. I think I see it as a sort of mirroring that and, and trying to re reassert a sort of, I don't know, a, a certain type of national identity or national uh, status. Um, yeah, I, 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 but I couldn't speak for the uh, the concerns of the right specifically because I don't share those concerns. It's for them to make those arguments, I think. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, John. That's the end of the question. Just just for the sake of completeness, we have a, a note of clarification from Professor Hayes that's popped up in the QAA. Just to say that Adam Habib, the director of SOAS, is facing calls from thousand students to have him sacked or disciplined. He didn't use the N word, but referred okay. to it. And apparently he is on the first, the first on the list, uh, the banned list that uh, that um, that uh, Dennis Hayes put on on the hyperlink. OK, I stand corrected. Apologies. I I, I, uh, I didn't I didn't realize I thought I thought he, he had used that, but I stand corrected. That's fine. OK. I'm just conscious of time. I think it's just ticked over to one o'clock, which I think is most likely to be the scheduled uh, finish time. So just on behalf of everyone present, I, I'd like to thank you, John, ever so much for a really fascinating and wide ranging uh, talk about what is a, a really important current and ongoing debate. As we can hear, see from the Q&A, there's probably an appetite and probably a desire and probably a need to have ongoing uh, debates where, where these such issues can be debated to and fro in a public forum. And it would be lovely to um, arrange for that at some point in the future, perhaps when we're back on campus. But I don't know, John, if you want to say just a final few words before we wrap it up. No, just to, just again to thank you really to thank you for giving me the oppo opportunity to uh, to do this and to to talk about something I don't I don't actually get that often get a chance to talk about in my teaching because my teaching is more more focused towards uh, journalism and my sort of more recent res research is journalism focused so yeah thank you for that opportunity and if if anybody have any anybody has any questions or or uh, wants to follow up any of this this discussion then you know please feel free to email me and, and get in touch. I'll be happy to uh, to chat further about some of these things. Thank you.